Welcome to the eighth annual Humanities and Social Science Conference at William Patterson University. <coughs> My name is Dr. Jana Hill, acting chairperson of the Department of Africana World Studies and a member of the conference committee. Again, welcome. We are in great company today. Before I introduce the morning panel, I'd like to first take a moment to thank Acting Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Dr. Wartina Davis. As well as Acting Associate Dean, Dr. Ian Marshall. And our Assistant Dean, Dr. Michael Gordon. I can't forget uh, to also thank those, fact, those staff in the Dean's office who really helped put this conference together. You can clap for them too. There are several university administrators in the audience, too many to thank individually, but I'd like to thank them for their continued support of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. And then finally, to the conference committee. Thank you for your service and for creating a space for our, our ideas to synergize into what we have planned today, our 2019 Context Conference, entitled, My Ancestors' Crimes, Not Mine, Grappling with the Legacy of Privilege and Power While Building a Better Tomorrow. This conference uses the academic tools provided by the disciplines in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences to help answer the following questions. So I know that my students in the audience have their pens and papers out to write these questions down. What responsibility do people in the present have for dealing with the consequences of our predecessors' actions? By what public and collective means does a society fully address the violent events of its own history? And how can we achieve restorative justice for past wrongs while addressing the problems we encounter and live with today? To answer these questions, by the way, do I need to repeat those questions? Is everybody okay? To answer those questions, we will be in, immersed in what the ancestors call Sankofa, learning from the past to prepare for the future. Our morning session focuses on America's legacies. Our keynote address will help us shift our view of contemporary society, while our afternoon session highlights future visions. And now for our first panel. We have three rock star panelists this morning. Dr. Jules Gill Peterson, faculty member at University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Autumn Womack, faculty member at Princeton University. And Dr. Vanessa Agger Jones, faculty member at Columbia University. Through their research, they will individually and collectively help us contextualize and better understand how we can redress the legacy of privilege and power while building a better tomorrow. So to our audience, I hope you do have your pens and pencils ready, notebooks. We are going to start with Dr. Peterson. Thank you. Good morning, hi everyone. I'm gonna try and wake you all up to, or wake myself up again. Um, um, thank you all so, so much for, for being here and also for inviting me and thank you to everyone that has had um, a hand in organizing and making it possible uh, for me to be here today. Um, so what I'd like to share with you this morning um, is a reflection on the archive and practice of transgender history uh, in a moment that's defined not just by a need for redress, but also by ongoing emergency when the attacks mounted on trans people are many 
It's not lost on me that only a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments uh, on a matter that will determine whether or not trans people enjoy any basic civil rights protections. And as a historian, I couldn't help but hear Justice Neil Gorsuch's claim that what concerned him above all in that case was, quote, the massive social upheaval, end quote, that would result if trans people could come to work wearing the clothes they already wear, if they use the bathrooms they already use, or if they were to be hailed with the names and pronouns they already have. The point being that Justice Gorsuch can only conjure such social upheaval if he first imagines that trans people don't already exist, that the lives before him in the court are unprecedented or lack historical foundation. And by the same token, so too can he imagine that trans people haven't already been living under conditions of overt discrimination and exclusion from work, housing in the public sphere for many decades. And in the specific case of trans children who form the focus of my work over the past several years, I'm thinking of a different kind of serious threat that has passed itself off as utterly respectable. There is an organized, well-funded, transnational network of largely white cisgender moms who are coordinating their efforts to libel, mystify, and harm trans children by denying the very terms of their existence. They go by various names. Sometimes we call them TERFs, that's Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminists, though that's a term that many of them don't like to be called. Um, or their own very kind of bizarre formulation you may have encountered, gender critical. In any case, these groups are working overtime to spread lies about trans children, especially that they are being somehow coerced into transition by doctors, or that many regret their decisions to transition. Um, with the support of various media, especially in countries like the UK, but there's plenty of these folks in the US as well, they're bombarding the public with anti-trans rhetoric that takes children as its target. And what is the goal of all of this activity? These gender-critical mom groups claim, as it's so easy to claim when adults, but especially white women, do this to kids, it's in the best interests of children. It's a form of care. In reality, they're systematically working to put trans children's health and well being at risk, amplifying and conducting bullying, increasing stress and pain, and reveling in their desire for the total erasure of trans people through their childhoods. So I'd say with no hyperbole that the political unconsciousness of these campaigns against children is sustained by the belief that trans kids are most desirable when they have committed suicide. This situation creates unique stakes for the work of researching, curating, and sharing trans history. The matter at hand is not just repairing the accumulated damage of the past, but making the past available for the urgent work of justice in the present. So I published a book whose central argument is meant to sort of intervene in this way. In arguing that trans children actually have history, that their existence is not a product of the contemporary world, what I mean to do is sort of visit as much destruction as possible upon the many libels that circulate about them from groups like gender critical moms who are all too eager to suggest that children are only trans because it is trendy. An astonishing lie if you ask any trans person you know how popular they feel right now. Or because doctors are supposedly giving out trans healthcare like proverbial candy. An even more astonishing lie actually, considering that the wait time for competent and affordable uh, health care is often a very dangerous obstacle in trans people's lives. So what I want to offer you all to think with me about today is sort of just one aspect of how we might take on this prevailing anti-trans situation. And it concerns something that kind of shamefully sounds pretty small. It's about wanting trans children or liking trans children. That is, it's about how to represent and actually make good on an overwhelming want for trans children, a desire that there be trans kids in our world. And for me, that want finds one form in archival research, in historical work. 
But this is also a reflection and a story about what happens to your life when the culture that you live in doesn't want you or doesn't like you. And that experience is also archived, as I'll explore um, very briefly in some letters I want to share from the 1960s. And so as we think about a politics of liking or wanting trans kids, I'll ask us to think about what has or hasn't changed since this childhood I'm about to talk about. And there's a longer sort of fully contextualized discussion of these materials um, in my book, but I'm just going to leave that all aside because I don't think we need it today. But basically what you should know is that there's a larger context of um, letters written by trans children as far back as the 1960s to major doctors in the field asking for support. And one of those doctors was Harry Benjamin, who in New York City in the 1960s had a very important clinic that was um, sort of foundational in setting up some of uh, today's forms of trans medicine. So these letters show us a very simple dilemma that comes from the adults in your world not wanting you to exist in the first place. What happens when adults stop you from transitioning in childhood and so you don't get to grow in the gender you know yourself to be? One answer is you don't stop growing. And so one question to think about is what does trans life feel like when that life strains against itself, precisely in its adolescent growth, not allowed to transition and so threatening its own sustainability? Writing under a pseudonym from rural Ohio in 1968, this young girl who I'll call Vicky introduces herself in her first letter to these doctors as, quote, a 14-year-old boy who wants nothing more out of life than to be a girl. While she'd already come out to her father, he wasn't understanding and had withheld his consent for her to go see a doctor in nearby Columbus. So her first letter asks the doctor to write back and try to convince her father to let her see that doctor in Columbus. Or perhaps she wonders, could he just mail her a prescription for hormones? Vicky also narrates an overview of her day-to-day -day life, mentioning that she's afraid at school, quote, because the kids are cruel, that her grades have been slipping, that she has to be on a diet because of weight gain rooted in deep depression, and that she's tried to commit suicide at least once. The doctor's letter replies in a way that sort of boils down to one line, and here it is. Be patient, finish your education, and see how you feel once you are matured. Undeterred, Vicky continued to write letters every few weeks with various questions for these doctors over the next two years. Here are some of her questions. Is it possible for you to get some kind of permit to let me wear women's clothes? Could you give me a prescription for something for my nerves? Or later she asked, could she eat hormone cream to simulate the effects of estrogen? At the same time, she kept the doctors apprised of her life. After coming out to her best friend at school in a written letter, she was humiliated when it was passed around the class. I was never so embarrassed in my whole life, she wrote. And her peers were very vicious. They're always hitting me and yelling at me. My arms are black and blue, and I can't help but not do anything. The doctor, who was just letting a secretary reply on his behalf at this point, showed little to no interest in any of these reports. And so when the doctors insist that Vicky should wait until she reaches the age of 18 to begin taking estrogen, his attempt to dismiss her institutes a crucial deferral, an interval, in which waiting is an aperture for growing, but paradoxically both in a life-sustaining and a toxic sense. Well, since nothing can be done until I'm 21, she replies, I'll just have to try and wait. But in that interval of waiting, her body continues to surface in her letters, kind of usually beside the point of those letters, but maybe for that reason all the more important to us. So at one point she asks for a note from this doctor to be excused from gym class, where her peers are so cruel and violent that her body has become paralyzed. I can't help but not do anything, she explains. This sort of strangely increasing paralysis of her growth condensed into moments of conflict in spaces like the gym is so extreme in magnitude that it both keeps her alive and yet poisons that quality of life. I think about running away, she confides, but I can't. I've tried killing myself, but nothing happens. 
At the very worst, I just get sick. After a year had gone by, she remarks, I don't know how I've managed to live through it. In the spring of 1969, Vicky sent exciting news. Finally, my father said I could have the sex change. And with that permission, she continued on, here's what I want you to do because I've tried, but I get too embarrassed. Please write him a letter explaining why sex changes are performed and that they, me, do not have to be hermaphrodites. That's all Vicky's language. It's possible that Vicky made up this permission to try and like get the doctor to finally do something, right? Maybe it was true, I don't know. Either way, the doctor never wrote that letter. And by the summer of 1969, she'd moved in with her cousin in Columbus and went out in public as a 16-year-old girl. By her estimation, quote, people have never questioned me. I've been in ladies' restrooms, been whistled at, even been helped with my coat. She also felt certain that her father would now finally pay for her to see a doctor. The next letter I write, she added enthusiastically, will either be telling you I get the operation or I was turned down. And to that end, she added a further set of questions, this time about trans children and trans history. Here they are. Who is the youngest female to become male? Who is the youngest male to become a female? Can sex changes have children? What does it take to be a true transsexual? Who was the first sex change? When was the first sex change performed? Do you make all your patients having a sex change live one year in their new sex before surgery? So in, in my book, this is how I conclude my reading of these letters with this, this following paragraph. While it would certainly be possible to read Vicky's writing as a symptomatology of straightforwardly emotional pain, such structures reveal next to nothing about her situated knowledge as a trans girl in deferral. How can we explain, after all, that doctors who in principle had nothing to offer would still correspond with her for two years? The initiative and boldness that Vicky expresses by going toe to toe with the leading figures of trans medicine deserves to be underlined. It was no small feat to carry on about diagnosis and hormones with two endocrinologists. Perhaps part of that discursive work for Vicky was refining a way of talking about herself so that when she found a doctor in Columbus, she was better able to negotiate. Still, is this virtuosic practice of medical expertise by a trans child really an account of agency? The extreme limitations of the medical model could not be more apparent in the constant refrain of no from doctors. The force that stretched the interval in which Vicky continued to grow as an adolescent, but at such a high cost, her frequent references to suicide attempts being only the sharpest example. There is no scene of resistance in the writing of trans children. When I read this passage again and read Vicky's letters again, I'm struck not just by the impossible situation of being forced by adults to live on without being allowed to transition. For Vicky, that cost was evidently very high. And so when I see gender critical moms trying to delay trans children's access to social and medical transition, I see an unbroken chain. 50 plus years of adults magnifying the pain of being denied the right to grow into one's own body. That should make us all pause. But what I want to leave you with is something that isn't in the book, something that has come from my reflections on it being in the world, in this world for the past year. But in that book, I make a sort of robust argument against trying to protect trans children, because that frankly has nothing to do with listening to them or affirming their needs or desires. After all, those gender critical moms who want to deprive trans children of the right to be say they are protecting children. Right? People say they're protecting children all the time. So if we want to support trans kids, we can't just reply with our own politics of protection. Instead, I've called for adults to learn to listen, to respect trans children as real, and to learn to desire their existence, to want them in the world. And here I see a structural similarity between trans misogyny and the hatred of trans children. There's a lack of want in our culture for trans women and children, especially when they're not white. So that the nauseating violence and death that is widespread against trans women and children of color is as normalized as it is visible or invisible. So here's my dilemma a year after I wrote those words about Vicky that I just read to you.
This world still doesn't like girls like her, and it doesn't want girls like her. Her archive of letters, which details what happens to a trans life forced to grow under such conditions, isn't all that different from the lives of many trans kids today who are unable to find support, access to transition, and care from the adults in the world around them. And so I find that in spite of what my own book says, I really do wish that I could protect trans children from the violence of state power or families. I really do wish I could shelter them from the casual pleasure with which adults regard them as simultaneously spoiled beneficiaries of a lack of suffering in their supposed access to childhood transition and, most interesting, when they commit suicide. And I really do wish I could protect them from the regime of gendered power that authors the world in the grammar of cis gender and then leaves them to sort out the rest on their own. But of course I can't. And so I don't really have to be on the hook for that desire. But it's persistence in the face of my own scholarship's explicit argument against such a desire feels disorienting. And I have the creeping feeling that mainstream trans affirmative politics is a kind of Titanic where the women and children are being loaded onto the lifeboats first, as if that benevolent gesture were actually life preserving. And so if I want us to think about what it would take for this culture, and let's include here prominently its white moms and its Supreme Court, what it would take for those people and institutions to actually like and want trans children, I'll have to tie it to shame. Shame over this world into which trans children are thrown without a choice and left to survive. Shame over how little that world's fundamental threat to their lives has shifted since Vicky was a 14-year-old girl. Shame over the active switch point between trans misogyny and infantilization that even in polite circles remains largely unspoken because the powers that be really do prefer that trans women and children not exist. And shame too in knowing that our efforts in studying the past and bringing it to life can't on their own move the world enough to relieve any of those dangers, even if they help. Not too long ago at a reading, someone asked me and the other authors there what our experiences had been like in publishing work about trans history in this historical moment. And my answer then sort of remains the same today. It's been painful, not because I mean to minimize what this kind of work might do in returning histories to trans communities, in challenging anti-trans discourses, or in putting pressure on the conservative center of so-called progressive allies. It has to do with what historical work cannot do and what it is never meant or intended to do. In the face of the sustained attack that marks trans life in the world today, especially for women and children, but even more so <clears throat> if they are of color like me, the radical insufficiency of thinking and writing feels, however else it is worthwhile, somewhat shameful. But I see that not as a failure, but rather as a feeling we have to work with as we bring, bring trans histories into public light. Trans studies scholar Ava Hayward, I think, is right to say that what trans studies as a field ought to concern itself with then is not ontology, who or what it is to be trans or not trans, but actually want and desire. And for better or for worse, that means that today, my overwhelming want for trans women and children is a desire replete with shame. Though in the same way, it also registers as an especially sweet love, one that is the furthest thing from maternal for a girl like Vicky, who th beautifully could have been everything she wanted to be, but shamefully not in this world and not in this history. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for being here. Um, and thank you to the committee for inviting me and to all of the panelists. Um, it really is a pleasure to share my work alongside you guys. Um, so today I'm going to offer some thoughts about what I understand to be the difficult task of visualizing slavery's afterlife. And I'll talk a little bit about that more, that term a bit more in a second. And I'll do that um, by way of a perhaps unlikely figure, Zora Neale Hurston. Um, so real quick, are we there? Cool. Um, who knows who Hurston is? Yes? Their eyes are watching God? 
Okay, well, well, that's okay. I will give you a quick overview, and even if you do not, or if you know or if you don't know, this will orient you a bit. So a quick and totally insufficient bio because I could not even begin to encapsulate everything in 30 seconds, but I will try. Okay, so scholars believe that Hurston was born in 1901 in Notasuga, Alabama. Um, I say believe because Hurston, as I'll talk about in a bit, was really playful, right? So we don't actually ever know what was true and what wasn't, so she always was trying to push against the boundaries of expectations of even the very idea of facts and truth, right? Um, when she was still a toddler, she moved to Eatonville, Florida, which is an all-black town just outside of Orlando, right? So this will also become important to think about her as somebody who grew up um, in explicitly black social life, right, at the turn of the century, which was very unique. Um, by the time she was a teenager, she moved to Washington, D.C. She had a ton of different careers, hairdresser, um, I think she was a manicurist, she did some odd jobs, a maid, um, but she ended up at Howard University where she got an associate's degree. In 1925, she moved to New York City. Um, she was emerged in Harlem's literary elite, so Harlem Renaissance, yes, we know, we got it, okay. Um, and she also enrolled at Barnard College, where she studied anthropology, which will also become important. Um, in 1937, she published Their Eyes Were Watching God, which is perhaps her most, or is her most famous book, her most famous novel. Um, but she also authored a collection of folklore, Mules and Men, an autobiography, Dust Tracks on the Road, and dabbled in the worlds of theater, dance, and film, which I'll talk about today. She died in 1960 in total poverty and obscurity, actually in a, as what amounts to a poor house, we don't have them now, but public housing, or not even public housing, a state institution, for lack of a better word. Um, and then she was resuscitated, if we can use that word, in the 1970s, largely due to the efforts of black feminist theorists like Alice Walker and Mary Helen Washington. Okay, so we know who she is, we're oriented, let's get to it. Um, towards the middle of her 1928 essay, How It Feels to be Colored Me, Zora Neale Hurston proclaims slavery a thing of the past. First published in the world, in the May issue of the leftist magazine, The World Tomorrow, How It Feels to be Colored Me promised readers access into the highly coveted, if deeply nebulous, terrain of racial feeling. But whereas 25 years earlier, the racial philosopher W.E.B. Du Bois declared the feeling of being black at organizing function of the color line, recall his famous phrasing, how does it feel to be a problem? Herson suggests that feeling colored and slave history are mutually exclusive. Indeed, towards the middle of the semi-autobiographical essay, which moves readers from the front porch of the all-black town Eatonville, Florida, to the hallowed and exceedingly white halls of Barnard College, to New York City's jazz clubs, Herson admonishes, quote, Someone is always at my elbow reminding me that I am the granddaughter of slaves. It fails to register depression with me. Slavery is 60 years in the past. The operation was successful and the patient is doing very well, thank you. The terrible struggle that made me an American out of a potential slave said, quote, on the line. The reconstruction said, get set. And the generation before said, go. I am off to a flying start and I must not halt in the stretch to look behind and weep. End quote. So Hurston was also really funny. Um, here, Hurston's insistence that emancipation was, quote, a successful operation anticipates contemporary scholars who query the, quote, psychic hold of slavery. What Soyika Diggs Colbert, Robert C. Patterson, and Aida Levy Hussein have recently described as the process by which slavery is understood as, quote, the distinguishing feature of black social life, end quote, the thing which one most must, quote, get over in order to be socially and psychically well. As Hurston would have it here, she is free of slavery's grip. Yet in true Hurstonian fashion, where things are never quite as they seem, Hurston was in fact deeply engaged with excavating slavery's psychic, physical, and material residues. And she of course thought about slavery, the past, and how the past resonates in the present. Most notably in her recently released book, Barracoon, or The Last Black Cargo, an account of the life of Cujo Lewis, the man who many believe to be the last known survivor of the Middle Passage. In addition to being an exercise in ethnographic expertise and an invaluable historical document, 
Barracoon was just one form that Hurston turned to as she tried to render legible Lewis's story. And in this regard, the book signals her ongoing effort to grapple with the vicissitudes of slavery in the present. In fact, Barracoon was not Hurston's first time writing about Lewis. Prior to drafting the manuscript, which sits somewhere between slave narrative, biography, and ethnography, Hurston published a short essay on Lewis in Carter G. Woodson's Journal of Negro History in 1927. Later that year, she returned to Alabama under the sponsorship of Woodson and her patron, Charlotte Osgood Mason. Together, they equipped her with a $200 a month stipend, a car, so this is Hurston being Hurston in front of her car, and the directive to, quote, collect all information, both written and oral, concerning the music, poetry, folklore, literature, hoodoo, conjure, manifestations of art, and kindred spirits related to and existing among North American Negroes. So they were like, just get everything black. We don't care. We just want the goods. Um, they also equipped her with a handheld camera, which I'll talk about more in a second. During this trip, Hurston traveled through Alabama, Florida, and Louisiana, collecting material that would form the basis of her 1935 collection, Mules and Men. But before stopping in turpentine camps and mining towns, Hurston planned to visit Lewis. In a letter to Langston Hughes, who was her um, kind of like pen pal um, before they had a falling out, she had falling outs with everybody. Um, she was the common denominator. Um, in a letter to Langston Hughes dated December 9th, 1927, she sketched the beginning of her itinerary. Quote, I'm leaving for the South on Wednesday the 14th on the 340 from Penn Station en route to Mobile. Long train ride to Alabama. I shall see Cujo first as he is old and may die before I get to him otherwise. One year later, Hurston began working on Barracoon or The Last Black Cargo. After years of gathering notes, she was confident that she had finally found the appropriate form for, for communicating the complexity of Lewis's life story. Right, so he narrates how he came um, from West Africa, how he arrived in Alabama, enslavement, emancipation, and freedom. It's a rare document. We never get that whole stretch. Right, We get either one side of um, emancipation or the other. Um, the manuscript, which she alter alternately referred to as the African thing and Kasula, this is him, before finally settling on Barracoon was never published during her lifetime until recently. Um, when she submitted it to her editor, Henry Block, he simply told her that it was, quote, not ready. Working with what was likely a mix of resignation and determination, in 1944, Hurston published The Last Slave Ship in the American Mercury. Like her 1927 essay, The Slave Ship provides a cursory historical overview of Lewis's life. Hurston also toyed with the idea of featuring Lewis in the final chapters of her in-progress manuscript, Negro Folk Tales of the Gulf States. In 1930, she floated the idea past Mason, writing, quote, in the last chapter of the, of the book, I shall let Kasula tell his little parables. When I see you next, tell me what you think of the idea, end quote. Never one to be bound by formal or genre conventions, Hurston also tried her hand at filming Lewis. And in 1928, she recorded a five-minute silent film, which I'll play in just a second. So one of the things that I want to suggest in kind of mapping all of the different ways that Hurston tried to tell and communicate um, Lewis's story is that in her near manic movement across mediums, we can see an unresolved effort to grapple with the nuances of slavery, to find a mode and medium capable of holding Lewis's narrative. In this regard, Hurston could be said to be engaged with questions around the afterlife of slavery. In recent years, scholars and activists have turned to this framework to make sense, oops, not yet, of the various ways that slavery's logics continue to structure social life in general and black social life in particular. So one of the things why I say both of those is because none of us are outside of the afterlife of slavery, right? It's not just something that impacts black folks, although it does at a much higher and more acute level, but we are all kind of this is everyone's thing that we are living in. Um, in one of the most cogent and formative articulations of the term, Saidiya Hartman explains, quote, if slavery exists as an issue in the political life of black America, it is not because of an antiquarian obsession with bygone days or the burden of a too long memory, but because black lives are still imperiled and devalued by a racial calculus and a political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago. This is the afterlife of slavery, skewed life chances, limited access to health and education, premature death, incarceration, and impoverishment, end quote. 
Hartman's framework not only alerts us to the way that our contemporary moment is conditioned by slavery's organizing principles and institutions, but it also attunes us to the, those modes of life that can never be assimilated into narratives of historical progress. Lives like Lewis's that straddle the seemingly stable break between enslavement and freedom, past and present. If contemporary US life and politics are structured by slavery's legacy of refusing black humanity, then the logic continues, we are still awaiting the belated arrival of emancipation. So Lewis is quite literally the afterlife of slavery, right? So this is why I think it's interesting to kind of put him as a figure to think through these terms. In many ways, Hurston's work materializes and visualizes the conceptual angles of this school of thought. Lewis is, as I've said, quite literally the afterlife of slavery. And if, as she claims in How It Feels to Be Colored Me, Hurston was not so much concerned with what the afterlife of slavery feels like, then her effort to film Lewis does suggest that she was quite interested in what the afterlife of slavery looks like. The question of what slavery looks like would seem to have an obvious and established set of answers. After all, part of the work of the expansive archive of slave narratives was to paint a vivid and highly visual picture of slavery in order to activate the nation's moral conscience. So we can think of Frederick Douglass' 1845 um, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, which is kind of the ur text of the slave narrative, although there were hundreds. Um, we might also think of the countless filmic renderings of uh, slavery from Alex Haley's roots to Steve McQueen's 12 Years a Slave to the forthcoming Harriet Tubman biopic Harriet, to name just a few. In each case, the filmic renderings work to convey slavery's atmosphere and unpar with unparalleled historical accuracy. But visually rendering the afterlife of slavery is tricky business, and I want to suggest much different than simply rendering slavery as it really is, to conjure up another 19th century phrase. Um, not that the endeavor is really ever simple. Visualizing the afterlife of slavery requires taking into account the deceptively simple question, how do you visualize that which is still ongoing? And this, and I talk about this more in other work, this is actually also a deeply technical question too, right? It means reconciling the technical limits of the medium of film um, with this very calm kind of conceptual idea that, that slavery is still unfolding, right? And so if we think of film as something that um, approximates movement, right? It's supposed to give the illusion of movement. On the one hand, it makes total sense that this is something that we might use to kind of document and visualize the afterlife of slavery. But we also think of film and photographic mediums as being very contained and bound, right? So how do we reconcile the movement or the pulse of the afterlife of slavery with the medium of film? So this is also a technical question. Um, so how do you visualize that which is still ongoing? So Hurston was always deeply engaged in this question of movement and medium. As she aptly put it, black life is still in the making. A new kind is pushing out the old. So for her, black life was always in motion. Um, and her camera work begins to provide some answers to this conundrum that I'm setting out. According to the introduction of Barra Coon, when Hurston arrived, the critical introduction of the recent book. Um, when Hurston arrived at Lewis's home, she came bearing peaches as a kind of gesture of friendship and goodwill. But she also came equipped with a 16 millimeter handheld camera. What emerged was a five minute silent film that depicts Lewis telling his life's story. So I'm going to play just a bit of it. Let's see if I can make this happen. 
I'm scared to do this, but here we go. Uh, okay. Um, Kasula, the last of the Dakoi slaves, is among the 24 minutes of silent footage that Hurston recorded over the course of her three-year trip through the South. Of this footage, Kasula is both formally and conceptually distinct. Unlike the other films Hurston shot, which are for the most part non-narrative clips of black social life, children playing hand games, women dancing at a church picnic, baptism, Kasula strives for narrative coherence and technical sophistication. And strives is the important word there. In addition to a formal title, the film begins with a series of title cards, introducing Lewis as full of vigor at 89 and cheerful and dignified and always gracious and courtly. But for all of Hurston's attempts at, at editorial prowess, the film is riddled with technical inconsistence, inconsistencies. Much of the film is over or underexposed. Hurston accidentally covers the lens with her figure, finger for about a minute, which you guys saw. And after the initial title cards, she abandons all efforts at narration, leaving viewers with the odd sensation of watching a silent film of a, of a oral history. Um, it's also important to note that Hurston was not ever trained in camera work. Um, she was just given the 16 millimeter handheld camera, which was a relatively new technology in 1927. So we also see her trying to balance, right? How do you actually visualize this thing or, or make filmic or cinematic? But I want to suggest that in its formal and technical failures, we can find a rubric or a theory for what it means to see and visualize the afterlife of slavery. And in this regard, visualizing the, after, um, the afterlife of slavery is also a condition of possibility, right? Um, or put another way, Hurston's film can be said to inaugurate a filmic practice, and I think a filmic genealogy, and I can talk about that more later, that is premised on overexposure. Overexposure names the idea that the viewer is lured but never rewarded with the promise of unmitigated knowledge about or access to black life. Overexposure names an eruptive practice and an aesthetic intransigence. It points us to the sites and spaces that exceed available ways of knowing and seeing black life, and it suggests that perhaps above all else, black life and slavery's residues can never be reduced to the terms of realism or mimesis or objecthood. Visualizing the afterlife of slavery, then, means turning not so much to the straightforward documentary productions or realistic accounts of enslavement, although these are undoubtedly useful. It also does not mean simply viewing or circulating the depictions of imperiled black life, as in the case of the countless and virally circulated videos of anti-black police violence. Rather, it means instantiating a mode of viewership that insists that black life can never be reduced to a mere historical fact, an event, a piece of evidence, or an object that what constitutes the afterlife of slavery takes shape in the overexposed gaps, breaks, and blurs, the moment when we realize that film can never capture it all. This is the work that I believe Hurston was up to. How am I on time? Over. OK. Um, I don't know what that means, but I'll wrap it up. <laughs> I don't understand that gesture. Um, Hurston was up to, um, and I, I believe this is also um, the legacy that we see the filmmaker Jatovia Gary engaged with. Um, and the leap from Kasula to Gary, um, and particularly I'm thinking about her Gaverni project, might seem big, um, but it's one that I think we can see kind of playing with the limits of documentary evidence and how actually visualizing the afterlife of slavery means inhabiting these temporal breaks and interruptions, interruptions. Can I play like 30 seconds of it? Okay. You guys are strict. This is not a game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, real quick, because why not end with some sound? Because we've been quiet. Okay, and then we can talk about maybe how we see the overlaps. My 30 minutes, seconds are up, but Nina doesn't want it to be. Um, but we'll end with another evocation of feelings. So, I'm sorry, you said 30 seconds. <laughs> you didn't know what you were getting in that last 30 seconds, though. Um, okay, thank you guys. We can talk more about all of the connections. Thank you. <laughs>
thank you, Dr. Walmack. Um, I just, as we, as we uh, wait for our, our final panelist to come up to the stage, I want to make sure that the students in the audience are taking down or are, are recording these particular themes that are coming up. Love, I heard from Dr. Peterson, unearthing the underground as it relates to gender, telling your story, movement, and possibility. So those are just some things that I think we need to pay attention to, right? And maybe focus our questions on right after Dr. Agar Jones. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good morning. Hello. You awake? Are you here? Good morning. Hi. Can I have a wave? Hello. Hi. Good to see you. Wonderful. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. I want to thank Emma Haney, 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 um, and Jenna Hill for their hard work in organizing um, this day's events, as well as Yolanda Martinez, is Yolanda here, um, for her incredible administrative savvy. I feel really lucky to have been invited to join in this important and timely conversation. Um, uh, my father taught and deaned here, and I'm also grateful for the chance um, to return to William Patterson's campus. I remember it from the time it was a college before it was a university, um, and this feels like the place that I grew up, grew up in many ways. Um, further, I'm thrilled that all of you are here on such a beautiful autumn day inside in this auditorium. Um, and I'm really looking forward to our exchange, both about the work that I want to present to you today and about the broader set of concerns before us. And I want to also offer deep thanks to Jules and Autumn for those gorgeous papers that came before my own. It's a tough act to follow. But without further ado, I'll begin. So when I first met Roger, the person who I will call Roger for the context of this talk, I did not know, nor did he know, that he was dying. This was in 2010, and Roger and I were introduced at the offices of Envie, the Association Martinique Vivre Ensemble, or the Martinican Association for Living Together, the only organization on the island, which is a French territory in the Caribbean, that took it as its mission the support of so-called vulnerable populations, defined then as sex workers, LGBT people, and people living with HIV and AIDS. While we did not know that Roger was dying when we first met, what we did know that was that he was co-infected with HIV and hepatitis C. What we did know was that these were conditions treated as chronic rather than spectacular illnesses on the island at that time, and that the prognosis for him seemed to be good. What we did know was that Roger's citizenship, so as a French citizen, a part of the European Union, though living in the Caribbean, provided him with access to only a sliver, but an important one, of the resources of the French state and its centralized health apparatus. What we did know was that Roger took impeccable care of his health to the extent that he was able, that he chided me for not joining him on his training rides for the Tour Cycliste de Martinique, an island-wide bicycle race. So like literally people get on these bicycles and ride up and down mountains in the blazing, searing heat. I am not an athlete in that way and could never join him on anything like that. Um, I told him always I would wait for you at the end with a glass of champagne to toast you, but I'm not getting on the bike to go up the mountain. Um, uh, he eschewed non-prescription drugs and alcohol, and he managed his treatments, antivirals, antiretrovirals, with the kind of precision that made clinicians positively swoon. He had you know, alarms on his phone to take each of his medications, and his clinicians thought he was just the, the model patient. Um, I went to some appointments with him, and they just literally swooned over how good he was at taking his medication. What we did know, too, was that Envie's activists were involved in important campaigns to diagnose certain social and material conditions on the island as toxic, as impediments to the health and well-being of its organization's members. And while death did not hang over our conversations, Roger and I talked a lot about life, 
and in particular about how he managed to navigate the complex intersections of heterosexism, racism, seraphobia, and disenfranchisement that often placed barriers, though not intractable ones, in the way of his care. And because we are both gluttons, I love food, um, we talked to about food. Roger taking me on as a special project to convince me, l'Americaine, which is what everyone called me, the American, that I could eat well beyond our friends' homes at a time when the inexorable pressures of neoliberal globalization meant that increasingly people were favoring fast food over the home-cooked meal. And because we talked about food and about gastronomic pleasures, about eating and wellness, Roger and I also spent a lot of time talking about a pesticide called chlordecon, an organochlorine compound originally produced right here in the United States that was used for years on Martinique's banana plantations. In October 2012, I received a WhatsApp message from Roger asking me if I had seen the news, news that I had in fact heard from a veritable avalanche of people that day via every imaginable form of communicative media. Lamenting that we would never again feast on langouste gratiné, which is like lobster, cream, cheese, deliciousness, um, he pointed to a story that was going viral that afternoon. This was a, 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 a one of the pictures from that moment. A spokesperson from France's Ministry for the Environment had announced the prohibition of lobster fishing off of Martinique's shores. Citing high levels of contamination by a pesticide called chlordecon, the, the ministry shut down fishing operations, fearing that consumption of crustaceans would lead to grave health consequences for local eaters, citizen and tourist alike. Local fishermen were devastated, and local eaters were too. The chemical runoff from the island's fertile northern triangle had reached the sea, and as a consequence, Martinique's fish were then and are increasingly diagnosed as toxic. Chlordecon contamination has emerged as a problem for Martinican visions of a healthy environment, as well as for ideas about what foods might make for a healthy body, in addition to becoming important in local debates about gender and sexuality. As a compound that has the power to disrupt endocrine systems, alter hormone loads, and damage reproductive capacities, this environmental toxin is now a key player in new narratives about the relationship between bodies and their environments in the Antilles. So there's a really long and twisted story that I won't have time to tell you here um, about how the chemical made its way to the island, but here it is in brief. From 1972 to 1993, local white planters who were descendants of the island's first slaveholding families, they're called the Beke, locally, colloquially, colloquially, imported and circulated chlordecone, this pesticide, on the island's banana plantations, even though by 1972, it had been formally interdicted by international regulatory bodies. So here in the US, there was a huge spill in the James River uh, in Virginia, where the pesticide was being produced. And it came under serious regulation by international bodies, and people said, we need to get this thing off the market. No one can use it. Um, but these planters brought it to Martinique to be used long after um, folks in the US and in Europe and elsewhere had said it was way too toxic to be in circulation. Um, like other chemicals of its class, chlordecone was first produced during the post-World War II boom in the United States and was distributed by Hopewell, Virginia-based Allied Chemical to markets overseas. Um, oh, that's the wrong, oh, there it is. Uh, so according to the World Cancer Research Institute, as recently as 2014, Martinique has had the distinction of being the place with the highest rate of prostate cancer in the world, um, calculated in diagnoses per 100,000 residents. Martinique and intellectuals Raphael Confion and Louis Boutrin have argued that chlordecone exposure can account for these statistics. And in their 2007 expose, Chronique d'un empoisonnement annoncé, or Chronicle of a Poisoning Foretold, they contended that the island's residents are now facing what they call a genocide by sterilization. Further, they and others worry about what the chemicals byproducts, substances often called environmental estrogens, are doing to people's bodies. Recent popular responses have included panic about male effeminacy, so-called male effeminacy, and intersex births. Based upon suppositions that heightened estrogen loads have the potential to fundamentally change the workings of neurological and endocrine systems, 
ideas about chlordicone exposure have been reconfiguring narratives about the biological basis for same-sex desire and gender transgression. These ideas are also reactivating fears about the salience of post-slavery plantation politics in the elaboration of people's gendered and sexual lives, right? So the, the chemical reactivates our interest in what the plantation has to do with who we are. So for example, one of the narratives repeated during my field work on the island about the origins of same-sex desire, that was not my question, but this is what people were interested in talking about, like where does this come from? Um, and for men in particular, was about their ingestion of chlordicone. Many espoused the vernacular idea that Martinique and men's bodies were becoming more estrogenic and thus their desires more so-called womanly. So body burden is a term used for the past half century by mostly anglophone toxicologists to describe the accumulated amount of harmful substances present in a human or in a non-human animal body. This is an example, an image from the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition. I think it's one of the better ones circulating in our worlds today. Um, and this organization is an activist organization committed to reducing the effect of e-waste on Northern California's soil and bodily ecologies. And so what you see here are things identified as contributors normally, typically, to body burden. So you have things like cadmium or dioxins or PCBs, some of the things you may have heard about um, in your social and material worlds. Um, taking Martinique's chlordicone contamination as a point of departure, but thinking outward from the chemical to other forms of material and immaterial toxicity, in my research I've been reworking this idea of body burden to account for the ways that New World bodies, post-slavery bodies, black bodies remain inextricably entangled with the forces of capital, disproportionately porous in the face of exposure to and penetration by both toxic materials and toxic discourses. I ask how we might use chlordicone as a tracing device for the elaboration of a corporeal, a bodily, as well as a territorial record of enduring colonial violence, thinking, hum thinking human bodies in critical relationship to bodies of land and bodies of water. I'm particularly concerned in this work that we remain mindful while taking anxieties about environmental estrogens and chemical contamination seriously, that we don't fall prey to cis and heteronormative fantasies about so-called normal bodies and their gendered elaborations. When I returned to the island in 2014, I talked with Envie's former director, Fred Cronard, about Roger's death. So Roger dies in late 2013. Um, and thinking through the ways that Roger's health might have been compromised, Fred drew a connection that others are increasingly seeking to chart. He said, Roger's family refuses to believe that he died for any reason other than that they presumed he was a Makume, and Makume is a Creole colloquialism in Martinican uh, Creole that, for lack of a better translation, might mean faggot in English or in Anglophone Caribbean slang, a bati boy, right? Um, so they, the family believes he died because he was a makume, because of his HIV status. But I know, and you know, Vanessa, that he died because this place, because Martinique is toxic. Um, so Fred's statement operated on a number of registers. The toxicity that, I, that he identified was at once social, about the kinds of narratives about normative gender and sexuality that would equate literal toxicity with queer desires historical, about the agonized relationship of Martinican residents to debates about sovereignty in the region, right? Because Martinique is a place that never achieves political independence like so many other Caribbean states. Um, and material, about the impossibility of being truly well in the midst of a contamination. Fred's reflection prompted me or prodded me to think more expansively about the kinds of toxicities, both material and discursive, that led to a death like Roger's. Reading Roger's body as an archive of toxic accretions, I understand not only social violences, but also the accumulation of HIV and Hep C, of the pharmaceuticals that both healed and harmed him, and of the synthetic, synthetic chemicals circulating in the environment that his body ingested over his life course as part of a toxic effect of diffuse forms of power made manifest in what became, for Roger, fatal illness. And so while body burden's original meaning draws from a scientific definition of contamination, in my work I argue that body burdens are at once metaphorical and material, that they encompass the imagined and the embodied. Scholars of black life in the Americas have long been thinking about the kinds of toxic burdens that a body might bear, 
have documented and theorized what black bodies have been forced to carry and have been thinking through the effects of the things that accumulate or accrete in the spaces through which we move and in the spaces beneath our skin. And for me, body burden's toxicity is not just the story of the lead or of the PFAs in New Brunswick or Detroit or Newburgh's drinking water, or of the PCBs or organochlorine or organophosphate contaminations of Bahia or Foy de France or Vieques, or the story of any number of other material toxicities that have been and remain in the soil, air, water, buildings, and bodies of black communities this hemisphere over. This toxicity is also the legacies of toxic sociality, the enduring ways that racism, sexism, homophobia, and ableist interactions leave their marks on our bodies, as they did on Roger's. Shifting the language of the social determinants of health, for example, from race to racism, from class to classism, and from gender to gender discrimination, theorists like anthropologist Leith Mullings on the Sojourner Syndrome and demographer Arlene Geronimus on the premature so-called weathering of black women's bodies have been accounting for the health effects of persistent social stress in the lives of multiply, multiply oppressed people. Other black feminist critics have articulated how social and environmental harms become, and I'm quoting here, coded on a cellular level, as poet Claudia Rankin has put it, linking emergent theoretical concerns with both human and planetary metabolism, with our traditions of writing about how power is made manifest, how it shows up in the body, and of how it has made its way into our very understandings of who we are in the world. So according to chemical scientists, it would take 600 years for chlordicone to break down naturally in the environment. The contamination of this earth by synthetic chemicals like chlordicone is but one of the irreparable changes wrought by humans in this age that is called by some the Anthropocene. Now commonplace, predictions and pronouncements about this geological epoch remind us that we are at the end of the world as we know it and that global warming, rising sea levels, the acidification of the oceans, uh, crisis rates of species extinction, and ever escalating social disasters masked as natural ones are but some of the more visible markers of the imperilment of this planet. And according to epigeneticists, we pass on the cellular modifications that social stress, stress wreaks on our bodies to generations far beyond our own. The material manifestation of the transgenerational transmission of trauma is now the stuff of contemporary scientific research. And it focuses our attention on the ways that both material toxicities and social ones are persistent, stubborn, and enduring. So given the long durée of the toxicities that have been unleashed upon the world and upon our lives, this day's events prompts us to ask, what would it mean to detox? What would it mean to repair? Many of you will be familiar with forms of detox on Vogue today. Operative at the scale of individual bodies, we juice cleanse and we dry brush. We sweat in infrared saunas and drink milk thistle tea. Many of these are important things. In activist social worlds, we engage in restorative mediation circles. We reclaim indigenous and so-called traditional knowledges. And we consider collective investments in healing justice. Many of these are useful things, necessary things. At the scale of government intervention, there are limited efforts at reparation, repatriation of stolen artifacts, and rethinking of ownership structures for stolen lands. Necessary, important things. But do they detox us? Do they actually repair? At every scale and in every kind of relation, I think it would behoove us to think of detox as a horizon toward, toward which we might always aspire, but as a state that we might never achieve. Detox, as an analytic for the Anthropocene, might afford us a mode of grappling with history in our desire to address toxicities and their multi-sided elaborations head on, but can only work if we hold in view the problems presented by the fantasy of fulfillment from the, dr from the dream that the repair could be complete. The reality that something like chlordicone, like the history of transatlantic slavery, forces us to grapple with is that there can be no undoing and that there is no pure pre-contaminated state on the horizon, but there's thriving even after. While we may not all scale mountains on bicycles like Roger or find rapturous joy in a great meal, there is life even in toxicity's wake. Thank you. Excellent, thank you.
So we should add a couple of more uh, themes to our questions that we will take now. Um, health and managing bodies, corporations and their responsibility, planetarium metabolism, as well as detox. So we have about five minutes for questions. <laughs> if your shoulders are feeling heavy, they should, but I want to remind you that there's also possibility in the house. Uh, hello, my name is Adam. This is for the first panel. Um, I wrote down, is it possible that a portion of what the public v views as discrimination from the parents towards their children does come from a lack of understanding on what it genuinely feels like to have? and what I quote, that want and desire for trans life. I think it's fair to assume that most adults are not currently informed on this, informed on this topic, which could be attributed to the overall miscommunication. In combination with the overwhelming influx of emotion as any major event a family experience would bring, rather than approaching trans life as two opposing opinions, how can this be utilized as an opportunity for teaching and compromise? Okay, that's an amazing question. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think you're, is there a way I can make it not do that? Or like, <laughs> like put it farther away. away. Yeah. Yeah, okay. um, yeah, 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 so I think part of the, part of the problem is sometimes but can you all now still hear me? Okay. Part of the problem um, sometimes about trans childhood is not always just about gender identity, sometimes it's about childhood and how we think about the relationships between parents and children or adults and children. Um, and so one of the things that, I mean, also just, yes, I, I think part of the answer to the question was in your question in a really beautiful way. And I also think that that's sort of my sort of sense of what might it be like if we were in a culture where we didn't understand children as unfinished people? And because one of the consequences of that, right, is that we have trouble accepting children's uh, proclamations about themselves, right? We don't actually really trust what children say about themselves to a certain extent, um, as if adults know who they are, right? Um, like, yeah, trust me, you don't always know. Um, so one of the things that I often try to think about is like, what would a different parent-child relationship be like where the role of parents is not really to investigate like who their child is and to sort of guide them towards that, but actually just to receive who they are and sort of welcome that and affirm that. And that sounds a little bit vague and kind of abstract because it is, um, it's sort of a thing that we don't know how to do um, because we do understand that one of the goals of parenting is actually to like produce identity in children. Um, um, and whether or not that really works so well for actually all kids, I think, is an open question, especially around things like gender identity, um, where, you know, again, similar kinds of questions about etiology come up. And it's like convenient to think that a child's brain or hormones somehow made them the way they are um, in some sense. But instead, you could just sort of, yeah, greet what they say about themselves as wanted and desired and loved um, without it sort of having to be managed. So that's sort of one, one way I've been trying to think about that. But thank you. Such a great question. I'm such a high bar. <laughs> Hello. Um, I have a question that I think maybe touches upon a, a few things. I, I've been hearing a fair amount about research that draws into question when we talk about like the archetype model of um, statistical probability of, of health conditions. Um, you know, when you go in for your cholesterol, what your baseline is and what, you know, your probability of having cancer is. And that there's a lot of data coming out that these archetypes are based upon white representative examples. And so when you're told that you deviate from the norm, you're actually being compared to what is statistically a white probability. Um, and so I think, you know, 
we've talked about like medical and we've talked about environmental and we've talked about the gathering of data and trying to represent. And so I just thought that that maybe is an interesting thing for the three of you to kind of um, reflect on as, uh, you know, because it kind of touches upon each of the areas maybe. I'd be curious what you have to say. Yeah, that's a great. Shall I? Yeah, I should say something sorry. first, huh? Sorry, not to um, absolutely. I think one of the the um, the challenges with normative conceptions of who a person is and what makes a person is that our models are based. Uh, is this not on? Sorry. Um, our models are, um, at, at least in this world at this time, in this place, are often based upon a kind of white male cisgendered subject. Um, and one of the kind of challenges, I think, for the people who I work with, for example, in a place like Martinique, are, um, you know, f completely steeped in a French tradition of thinking about the universal subject, like we are all a citizen in the French tradition, right? There's a, um, uh, in French public schools, for example, um, everyone learns the same thing on the same day. So let's say it's the 14th day of the semester in the fall. Everyone in Fort de France in Martinique and in Paris and in Marseille are learning the exact same thing in the curriculum. And there's a kind of, um, a, a kind of centralization of an understanding of what it means to be a French citizen that is based entirely around um, a, a kind of white male subject. So um, there's, a, there's a line that comes up quite often in uh, kind of Martinican critiques of the French system. Our ancestors, the Gauls, is one of the lines that children are asked to repeat um, uh, in class. And so children sitting in the middle of the Caribbean are talking about their ancestors, oh, the Gauls, <laughs> that you know, has, has no bearing on who they are and where they come from. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's part of the seed and the root um, uh, of, of some of the, the larger questions about what does it mean to grapple with enduring coloniality in a place where um, that kind of conception of what it even means to be a person, a human, a citizen, has not yet been undone. Um, I think about data a lot. Um, but I think what's really interesting in regards to um, the films and Hurston, um, and if we just think of film and its relationship or its status as a repository of racial data, um, I mean, one of the reasons why Hurston, all of her films are kind of technical failure, failures, which is why I'm so interested in them, but it's because the film, the medium that she was working with at that time period actually could not register black skin. Um, because the film was, um, what is it called? Um, balanced, right? I have no language this morning. Um, balanced according to white skin. So that was the norm that the film was then created to record. Um, and she didn't have a professional lighting crew, and even if she did, there was no way that she would have been able to get the black and the white balancing, and she was filming in the hot Alabama sun. It was very bright. So things were just gonna go bad, and we can see that in some of the other films that I didn't show. Um, but so what the point is here is that the very medium of film, right, we can, we can think about it as something that's never actually been able to hold blackness. Like, it just can't. Like, that is written into the film's ontology. This is not a medium for that can hold the complexities of black life. So then what does it mean to try to hold the complexity of black life with this medium that wasn't built for it, right? There's always gonna be some, some negotiations, some problems, some overexposure, some underexposure, some gaps, right? And that's what I think um, the last film, the Jovia Gary, she, she's playing with that, right? Um, and that what actually happens, right? Um, black life actually happens in these overexposed gaps, right, what, what the film can't hold. Um, so I think that's one way to think about the data um, and also kind of to think about this, the legacy or the endurance of slavery, what I've 
following so many other amazing people and calling the afterlife of slavery, right, is to think about this legacy of black life as always being reduced to data, right? We're always gonna solve the problem beginning in the 19th century, mm -hmm. right, by producing data, right? If we have the facts, if we know how many people were killed by police this year, then we can solve it. If we know how many people are being displaced in Brooklyn by gentrification, then we can solve it. But actually, I mean, thinking about this question of norms and averages and data, it's never been able to give us the answer, right? The facts don't actually ever do it. Um, so then how do we think about data more complexly? And I think part of it is thinking about it as um, a logic that is never working in the favor of people of color as the average or the norm. Um, but I'm against data, even though I write about it. <laughs> I don't know what life is beyond data. Thank you. I, um, we need to break. Um, even though some of you might have burning questions, I know that there's a class uh, break now and folks are going to be going to their uh, 11 o'clock class and we're get, actually getting ready to have our keynote come in. So if you have any burning questions, please come up and, and ask the panelists and please give them a round of applause. Thank you.